Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Stephen Paul. If you don't know me, uh, I go here. Uh, so <laughs> that's, that's what I got for you today. Uh, Mike asked me to read the scripture reading for us today, so we'll be in uh, Hebrews 2, 11 through 17, if you guys want to turn there. I'm also terrified of microphones, so there you go. You got that. So, <clears throat> For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will sing hymns to you in the congregation. Again, I will trust in him. And again, here I am with the children God gave me. Now, since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these, so that through his death, he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. For it is clear that he does not reach out to help angels, but to help Abraham's offspring. Therefore, he had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way, so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters pertaining to God, to make atonement for the sins of the people. For since he himself has suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. Thanks, Stephen Paul. See, I told you, drummers can do more than one thing. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, Thanks a lot. Every guy's like, well, I'm not going to drum for this church. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good to see you from this side of the stage. If you would open your Bibles with me to Ruth chapter 4. And while you do that, I'm going to do something that's very helpful for all of us together. And I'm going to turn the air conditioning on just in case you're a little warm. There you go. All the warm bodies are like, yes. And all the people who are naturally cold are like, what are you doing? I'm already freezing. Well, I'm uh, thrilled to be able to um, conclude this awesome study, too short of a study, through the book of Ruth with you guys this morning. And as we're finding Ruth chapter 4, I probably won't say this at any other juncture for a very long time, but I want to talk briefly before we begin Ruth chapter 4 about Leverite marriage, which is odd to us. And I also want to talk about um, the family or kinsman redeemer roles uh, in Scripture. And so before we get into our text, I think it's just helpful for us to talk about two passages of the Old Testament that are going to be referenced in this text. And if we just kind of went through it, we might kind of understand, but this will hopefully provide some clarity to what's happening in Ruth chapter 4. Um, before continuing the story of Boaz and Ruth, Having a general understanding of these two topics and looking at the laws that we're going to see is really going to kind of explain what the people here have in mind as they're talking around these two things. So uh, spoken of in Deuteronomy 25, um, when we're talking about Leverite marriage, and then in Leviticus 25, uh, we talk about the family or kinsman redeemer role. Um, the purpose of these laws was to preserve the name and protect the property of families in Israel. These are laws that God gave to Moses in Leviticus. You see these laws given to him there at Mount Sinai, and then you see them repeated in Deuteronomy before the people cross over the Jordan and take possession of the land that God had given them to. And here's kind of what God wants people to get. God owns the land. It's his place. This world is his. I think a lot of times we get stuck in this mode of like, well, this is this people's land and this is this people's land. This is God's world. Amen? And so God wants people to understand this. It's his land. He doesn't want it exploited by rich people who would take advantage of poor people and those who are underprivileged and the widows. And so he puts laws into place around his land that will preserve the way that God's character is revealed. And when obeyed, these laws make sure that if a man dies, that his family name doesn't die with him, that his property wasn't sold outside the tribe or clan, but that it was preserved for him. So the role given to the family redeemer was to purchase the prof property for the family member who is being forced to sell it for any reason. It keeps it in the family. And as a widow, Naomi couldn't sell Elimelech's land. However, she could assign someone else the right to use the fields that he owned until the next Jubilee year. Inside of that, rather than 
have control over the field, go, or remain outside the family, Boaz requests an intervention. That's what we're going to see here in chapter 4. He's going to request an intervention to happen in the spirit of a family redeemer law to buy back the use of the field. Okay, that's one part of what he's going to do. Now, the Leverite marriage law, when you look at Deuteronomy 25, did not demand that the wife of the deceased landowner be wedded to the family member that redeems their brother's land. It was encouraged, but it wasn't required And what you see in this passage is really fascinating. The law originally was written to encourage a brother-in-law to marry their brother's wife so that, God willing, they would have a son that could carry on the deceased brother's name so that it wouldn't disappear from the land of Israel. So not only is it keeping the land in possession, but it's providing an heir for that family to carry on the family name and continue to care for the family's property. Now, refusal on the brother-in-law's part to raise up an heir for their brother would result in a hearing before the town elders that would be called for by the wife of the deceased, at which if the brother-in-law still continues to refuse to take that responsibility, he would take off his sandal, he would give it to the wife of the deceased man, and she would spit in his face. I have the passage up there if you want to read it. (laughs) It was like, nah, uh it's there. She would do that. So she would spit in his face publicly in front of the city leaders, in front of the elders. And this is all helpful understanding. So we're not going to see all of those aspects in the story today. But it helps us understand what they're doing, at least where it came from. And where this tradition began. So this circumstance is not exactly what you see described in Deuteronomy or Leviticus. But the law pertains to it. And Boaz is going to do something beautiful here. And I just want to point out so that you're looking for it as we go through the text. He's going to do something beautiful that this general understanding of these laws is helpful with. What's he going to do? I'm not going to tell you. you got to look for it. Are you ready? Ruth chapter 4. We're going to begin in verse 1. We'll take this in sections today just so we can break them down as we go. So look for... Things that are being done here that speak of grace, that speak of good character, that speak of just moral goodness in general. So Boaz, we know from chapter 3, Boaz has told Ruth, I'm, I, there's a closer family member to you than myself. I, I don't have the rights of redemption, so I'm going to have to have a conversation with this guy because there's a closer kinsman than me. If he'll redeem you, that's good. He can redeem you. But if not, he says, then as the Lord lives, I'm going to do it. So here we have Boaz at the end of chapter 3 with his sights set on the city gate. And it says this in chapter 4. Boaz went to the gate of the town and sat down there. Soon the family redeemer Boaz had spoken about came by. And Boaz said, come over here and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Then Boaz took ten, of the town's, ten men of the town's elders and said, sit here. And they sat down. He said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has returned from the territory of Moab, is selling the portion of the field that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should inform you. Buy it back in the presence of those seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you want to redeem it, do it. But if you do not want to redeem it, tell me so that I will know, because there isn't anyone other than you to redeem it, and I am next after you. I want to redeem it, he answered. So here at the beginning of this chapter, Naomi's theory about Boaz is proven true. Do you remember that from chapter 3 at the very end of that chapter? It's right there. You could probably look right at it, but we'll put it up on the screen for ease. Naomi, right at the end of that chapter, as Ruth came home and told her all that had happened at the threshing floor, says this in Ruth 3.18. Naomi said, my daughter, wait until you find out how things go, for he won't rest until he resolves this today. She says, Boaz is a man on a mission, Ruth. You don't have to worry about it. He's going he's to resolve it today. Sure thing. The next morning, where's Boaz? Right at the city gate. It's so romantic. I love it. So in Leviticus 25, you have to excuse me. I, 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 get real, I love this story. In Leviticus 25, if there was a refusal to participate in the Leverite marriage law, we see the wife of the deceased instructed to go to this location of her city, whatever city she's living in. She was to go to this location, to the city gate. Why the city gate, you may ask? Excellent question. The city gate was like the official court where judicial business was concluded and so, or conducted. So what happens there is this is where all the leaders of the city would gather was there at the gate. 
And so this is where, basically, if you want to draw the court together and make a decision, that's where it was going to happen. And Boaz, by doing this, is intentionally convening the courts, if, the courts, if you will, to make official judicial decision regarding Naomi's land and Ruth's future. Now, fascinating enough, in verse 1, when Boaz says, if you look at the text, to the closer kinsmen who had the first right of redemption for Naomi's family, he says, come over here, and he uses, there's a term that's inserted there, Poloni Almoni. Now you say, so this guy's name is Poloni. Nope. No, it's, a, it's actually a rhyming phrase that's equivalent to our Mr. So-and-so. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. It's like calling someone Mr. So-and-so. This is liter- it's a literary tool to conceal someone's identity intentionally. So basically, whoever's writing the book of Ruth is blocking out this person's name and saying, Boaz went to Mr. So-and-so and said this. Because if you'll notice as we go through this text, the man's name is never included. We never see who this other family redeemer was. So before we get on on how he talks to Mr. So-and-so, and I won't refer to him that way anymore, did you notice something about the way that Boaz explained the situation to him? Did you catch what happened? He left out that bit about Ruth, didn't he? He talks about the land, but he doesn't mention Ruth in the first telling of what's really happening. This may have been a tactic of Boaz. Well, I would say for an unknown reason, but we're probably like, yeah, I know what he's up to. Okay. He's, he's setting the stage here. He, he's got a plan. Boaz is clearly a man with a plan. But regardless, this reveals to us that the family redeemer who's first in line is willing to redeem the property. He's willing to do what Boaz first tells him needs to be done. He's interested in the field. He's interested in the property. What he's not interested in, we find out, is gaining a wife. Because when, when he finds out about Ruth, the story changes. Look at verse 5. Then Boaz said, okay, so you want to take this property, right? Because remember, that's what the guy says. I'll redeem it. Boaz says to him, on the day you buy the field from Naomi, you will acquire Ruth the Moabitess the wife of the deceased man, to perpetuate the man's name on his property. The Redeemer replied, I can't redeem it myself, or I will ruin my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption, because I can't redeem it. Okay, it's important to note here what I mentioned before, and if you look at those passages that I quoted from before when we're talking about Leverite marriage, there's no legal obligation for the unnamed kinsman nor for Boaz to marry Ruth according to the law. There's no requirement according to the law for either of them to have to do this. But Boaz applies a moral obligation. Boaz has gone an extra step. He applies something even further than what the law requires. He goes beyond what's required and he seeks to do what is right, what is honorable, and what is loving for Naomi and for Ruth. He's going past the required mark. And he's entering into this place that we would call mercy and kindness, and grace. He's showing more favor than is required. And I just want to like stop for a second and ask of us, do we see a law or a requirement and consider that that's the only thing we ought to do? Do you think that God gives us laws and requirements just so that we keep the law and keep the requirements? For more on that, read all of Romans. It's all about how it's not about keeping the law all the time. God has given us grace. God has brought us into his family, and we ought to reflect his character by going beyond graciousness, going beyond kindness, care, and mercy. And so Boaz is this beautiful picture here of him saying, this is what needs to happen here, and he puts a moral obligation on the situation and says, you have to do this for Ruth. According to the law, no but according to what's right and good and loving and caring. Yes, you do. The other kinsman, at this point, when he sees what's happening in this situation, he backs out. It could be for a number of reasons. He gives one. He gives one reason. He says it'll jeopardize his inheritance. Part of his estate, plus the land he purchased from Naomi, would end up belonging because of the right of the Redeemer, and because of the, the Leverite marriage law, it would belong to technically Malin. It would belong to her husband who had died, who he's raising up an heir for. And so part of his own estate would go to his son, if he had a son with Ruth. And not only that, but all the land that he purchases here will become his, because it's his family property. And so it puts this, 
his own, when he says it puts my own inheritance in jeopardy, he's right. He's right. Part of his own estate will then go to his son as well. But there could be other reasons as well, and I think it's interesting. Because marrying a Moabite is not an easy thing to ask someone in this country to do. Because of, the st- because of what's happened with these people in the past, because of, of what's gone on between wars between Israel and Moab, and because of how the Moab, Moabites were viewed by God's people and spoken of by God in his word, there's a hesitance very likely on his part to want to be married to a Moabite woman. And I think there's a really practical reason why he hesitates here as well. Both of the sons of Elimelech went to the land of Moab and married Moabite women. Where are they? There you go. I think that's part of it. There's some fear there. No matter what the true reasoning, no matter if there was deeper reasoning or the only one he provides is the true thing, either way, marrying Ruth is way too risky. It's way too risky and it's way too costly for him. The cost is too high. So this man chooses to protect his own property and perhaps even his reputation. And ironically, his concern to protect his own name, rather than committing to raising up heirs in the name of Elimelech, leaves him nameless. The thing that he seeks to hold on to, did he take it with him when he died? The the possession that he sought to hold on to, that he wanted to keep in his own name, did he take that with him when he passed? Or is that forgotten to him once you're gone? As the old adage says, you can't take it with you. And so if it was possession, it was taken away by process of death. And if it was reputation, he's not even named in the passage that he's spoken of. You see, when we consider the risk of doing the honorable, loving, gracious thing too high, if we consider that to be of more worth to keep what we have than to take the risk of being what we'll see with Boaz as being Christ-like, I think we find that we don't really keep what we seek to hold on to. I think that if we actually want to experience the fullness of this life, we become like Jesus as we're called to, and we become gracious and giving people. We we become people who are willing to take risks for others' benefit. He remains nameless. We never know what happens with him or his family or his property. We have to remember that as we follow the storyline of Boaz and Ruth because it's very different for them, isn't it? We don't know how things pan out for this kinsman. And what's interesting is, in a way, it's a lot like with Orpah as well. Do you remember her? She was the other daughter-in-law of Naomi. She was the other one. She was married to Chilion, the other son of Elimelech. And remember when she and Ruth were following with Naomi, and what, what happened there? Orpah did what? She turned back and went back to her family, didn't she? What happened with her? We don't know. What happens with Mr. So-and-so? We don't know. What happens with Ruth? Oh, we're not there yet, but we're about to be. You guys, we don't even know these people's end point. We don't see where they ended up. So what glory do they bring to God besides the fact that they reveal God's faithfulness despite their willingness to sacrifice, despite their willingness to serve? You see, God's going to be glorified no matter what. Are we going to be willing participants in that? Willing to give and to be gracious and generous and to follow him wherever he takes us to exemplify these people or be lost to history? It's not about making a name for ourselves. God will be glorified, but I want to be a part of him receiving glory, don't you? I want to be a part of him receiving all the glory that he's due and all the worship that he is worthy of. Better be those who are willing to take the risk to love and serve others and allow God to be glorified in whatever way that loving service reveals him to those around us. Those who are willing to take the risk of love, service, and obedience will bring honor to the Lord that's worth remembrance. And John writes a little bit about this in passing in 1 John chapter 2, verse 17. He says, the world with its lust is passing away. But he says, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. There is longevity to the one who serves the Lord. Remember what you ought to be focused on. Don't get caught building your own personal kingdom. Build the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Boaz is going to show us an example of this in just a moment. As for the closer relative, he says it plainly. Take my right of redemption because I can't redeem it. Well, because we did our homework before, this next section is not going to confound us very much. Look at verse 7. 
At an earlier period in Israel, a man removed his sandal and gave it to the other party in order to make any matter legally binding concerning the right of redemption or the exchange of property. This was the method of legally binding a transaction in Israel. So the redeemer removed his sandal and said to Boaz, buy back the property yourself. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I am buying from Naomi everything that belonged to Elimelech, Chilion, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabitess, Malon's widow, as my wife, to perpetuate the deceased man's name on his property so that his name will not, be, will not disappear among his relatives or from the gate of his hometown. You are witnesses today. Wouldn't it be interesting if like, I made a, a deal with one of you guys and I had to give you my Nike? That'd be really funny. That'd be interesting. The decision to pass on redemption led to something that was legally binding. It's that removal of the sandal that you see in Deuteronomy 25. And notice this, if we understand that text, then we see here that this is being applied to a different situation, but this removal of the sandal through tradition has been applied in many other legal matters, not just the wife of the deceased seeking for someone to raise up um, an heir for her husband. And what's tied to this is some shame. A refusal to help in this situation is a shameful thing for him to not do, even though it's not required again. Removal of one sandal. I don't know the last time you walked around and saw a grown person walking through the mall with one shoe on or not, but you probably thought about it, and maybe you said something. It's, it's a shameful thing for him to do this. Now, we don't see any spitting happening here. That's good. But it still is applied that there's something going on here. It is a legal transaction, but what he's done is refuse to go the extra mile to help this family. And in many ways, this is where Boaz's character comes into view. He represents to us not just good character, but Boaz represents something very important to us. He represents Jesus. Boaz in this situation represents Christ, and here's how. He wasn't the closest relative. He had to become the closest by the refusal of the other. Jesus became related to us. Even though, as, as it says in Philippians chapter 2, even though he was not in human flesh, he didn't count equality with God as something to be grasped, but he became a man. Jesus became flesh and blood. He had to become related to us before he could redeem us. Hebrews chapter 2, that passage I had Stephen Paul read, this is why. Look at verses 14 through 15. Now since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these. What is that? Flesh and blood. So that through his death, he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. Those who were in a situation that they could not stop, that they could not change, had to be redeemed or saved from that situation. And in order to do that, Jesus became one of us. He had to become the closest relative Boaz became the only one who could purchase and redeem Ruth. Jesus was the only one who could pay the price to redeem us because we're going to find in this there can be no redemption without the paying of a price. If you are redeeming something, you are paying for it. You have to pay for it. How did Jesus do it? 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. Ephesians 1, 7 through 8. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. Boaz reveals to us this greater grace of God that we see ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. Without the paying of a price, there is no redemption. It has to cost something. We were not redeemed for free. The blood of Jesus paid the price of our redemption. Amen? Hebrews 9.22 says, According to the law, almost everything is purified with blood. and Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Our ultimate redemption came by the shed blood of Jesus. May we never forget it.
May we look for it and see that when we read the words of Scripture and we see examples like Ruth and Boaz, when we see this bride who's being purchased by a groom who it's costly for him to do so. He has to pay for this property. He has to pay for all of these things, and he's willing to do whatever it takes, not only to redeem what belonged to the family, but to redeem Ruth. The moral obligation Wearsby said it so well, like Boaz, Jesus wasn't concerned about jeopardizing his own inheritance. Instead, he made us a part of his inheritance. Like Boaz, Jesus made his plans privately, but he paid the price publicly. And like Boaz, Jesus did what he did because of his love for his bride. Just take a moment and appreciate, along with me, because we're in this together, that we were purchased by the blood of Jesus as his bride. That's who we are. You may have remembered if you were with us at the very beginning of this study, very beginning in Ruth chapter one, I made the statement, this is our story. This is our family story. Look for the parallels that run throughout this. Look for the crimson thread that's woven all throughout this story of the redemption of people, of every person who's here in Christ called the church because of his shed blood. Remember that it costs God. Where there was shame for the relative that refused, there was blessing for Boaz who receives the sandal then in that situation as a symbol of his commitment to purchase everything that belongs to the family. And in his courage and disregard of the risk, Boaz will not only receive his bride, Ruth, but he will be remembered and his household blessed by God because he showed chesed, which is that kindness, that covenant, faithful, loyal, loving, compassionate care. Loving faithfulness that he's showing to Naomi, to Ruth. It's a sweet fragrance to the Lord. The way that we care for one another extravagantly, the way that we look after one another, even beyond what's expected or asked of us, is a fragrance of Christ in this world. We shouldn't be looking for what we have to do. Church, we need to be looking for what we have the opportunity to do and be taking those opportunities. Who has God put in your life to minister to that we should be going further in that care for? Not what's the bare minimum that I have to pay here. So many of us, and listen, there's, there's a good aspect to this. So many of us are those bargain shoppers, aren't we? You know exactly what I'm talking about. We're the retail is for chumps crowd, right? Shop those bargains. Okay, not a bad thing. I'm one of them. I'm with you. But how often is that the way that we're approaching our spiritual walk with the Lord when it comes to others? What's, what's, the, what's the lowest price? What's, what's the lowest commitment I can really get into here? What's the Lord asking you to do? If he's asking you to do it, don't ask how little. See how much you can give. See how far you can go. See how extravagantly you can love and how much you can care for others. Go to the utmost. If you're compelled to go the mile, as it says in the New Testament, as the Lord's talking about it, they compel you to go a mile, go to. Go further. Go beyond. That's what Boaz is doing here. It's what's beautiful about it. And it's crazy how often people that are remembered in Scripture are those who, are, who love extravagantly, who care so deeply and give all that they have. If we really want to be people that reflect and resemble Jesus, we have to be those kind of people. Let's let him mold us into that shape. Form us into the image of himself. We'll notice that there's a blessing then spoken over. Boaz, there at the gate, the people began to speak in verse 11. All the people who were at the city gate, including the elders, said, We are witnesses. Done deal. May the Lord make the woman who is entering your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built the house of Israel. May you be powerful in Ephrathah and your name well known in Bethlehem. May your house become like the house of Perez, the, house, the son Tamar, bore to Judah, because of the offspring the Lord will give you by this young woman. Ruth is directly connected in this blessing to two women in Old Testament scripture and indirectly to another, and I say indirectly not because they use the name of Tamar, but because she's going to be like Tamar, but in a totally different way. The significance of the comparison to Leah and Rachel is given in the blessing as all of the 12 tribes of Israel came from Jacob and his two wives, those present at this time, give the descriptive who together built the house of Israel. 
They're like, may this be the blessing that's upon you. May God do so much far beyond what you could ever ask or think through this woman that you're bringing into your home. And the blessing for Boaz begins with the final sentence of verse 11. Ephrathah means fruitful. Now, Ephrathah is the name of of a town that was later changed to Bethlehem. So Ephrathah is the region, the town of Bethlehem, but it's the former name of it. But what's awesome about it is they use that because Ephrathah means fruitful. And we know that Bethlehem, oh, I'm going to check you guys. What does Bethlehem mean? I heard it. That was good. (laughs) It means house of bread. And so what are they saying in this passage? They're saying this, may you be powerful in fruitfulness in your name well known in the house of bread. Now think about this, you're like, great, fruitfulness and bread, that's awesome. What was going on in the land that caused Elimelech to leave? Famine. What are they saying over the house of Boaz? May fruitfulness, may God bless you with fruitfulness here in your name known in the house of bread. In other words, they're blessing him with plenty. Boaz has just finished threshing his wheat, remember? His barley. He's just finished the threshing period. This is a time of celebration. Harvest is on their mind. Harvest is on their mind in this situation. Because of the redemption brought by Boaz for Ruth, the foreshadowing blessing speaks of fruitfulness in a land that has known so much pain and so much famine, both literally and spiritually. They know what it's like to suffer. This is the time of the judges. Everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. And they're saying, may the Lord bless this house in a very specific way. And oh boy, is he going to. And don't think dollar bills, y'all. Think differently. Think differently. Think about the blessing of God. Think about how God chooses to work. Not only is this the place where God will bless Ruth with a son, but in this same town from the line of Boaz and Ruth, who's going to be born here? David and Jesus, right? You're all right. You all win. I heard so many David, you're both correct. David and Jesus will both be born in Bethlehem, in this place. This blessing is so much more than just what begins with Obed. God is blessing Ruth and Boaz with something that goes far beyond what they could ever imagine. The comparison to Tamar in this text is fascinating because of the contrast. I'm not going to get into all the details of Judah and Tamar, but the way that Tamar gets pregnant is prostitution via her father-in-law. That's how Perez comes into the world. And when they say this, we understand that Tamar's pathway to the Davidic line is surprising, and only God could turn circumstances such as hers into something good. But with Ruth, God's blessing will come through faithful love and obedience. God is going to bless Ruth in an unlikely way, just as it was unlikely that Tamar would be a part of the Davidic and the Messianic line. But with Ruth, the way that God's going to bless her is going to be because of her faithful love and obedience. What a lesson for us to learn. God's purpose in the end will be done. Are we going to be a willing participant of that? Are we going to walk in a way that gives him glory and honor and praise? Rather than being used by God despite of who we are, you can look at Tamar's story, you can look at Samson for a case study in it. We ought to desire to be used by God because he found us willing and ready to be used by him. That's where we find Boaz and Ruth, ready and willing to be used by God, posturing themselves before him as his servants. The scriptures teach us over and again that willing submission to the Lord is wisdom that we ought to come to him and give him our lives. Paul says this to the Romans in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in the view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Don't conform to this age. He says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. This is what we are called to in Christ. We cannot go back to the fleshly ways of trying to do it on our own and being too afraid to take the risk that God has called us to and doing things our own way. We need to be conformed into the image of Christ, not being conformed to this age. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here we see this beautiful blessing spoken over Boaz, and we see that God 
does so much far beyond what people imagined. Boaz, it says in verse 13, took Ruth and she became his wife. It says, he slept with her and the Lord granted conception to her and she gave birth to a son. Notice that the Lord granted conception to her. The women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you without a family redeemer today. May his name become well known in Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Indeed, your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Naomi took the child, placed him on her lap, and became a mother to him. The neighbor women said, a son has been born to Naomi, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. For all those years in Moab, Ruth had been unable to bear children from Malin. Quite possibly 10 years. We would call that being barren. And here the Lord blesses her and she gives birth to a son that they name Obed, which is short for Obadiah. It's fascinating to see the Lord bless her in a very special way as she's decided to follow the Lord and to honor his wishes. If you want to read an astounding accolade in the Old Testament, you can read it right here. Indeed, your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons. Read that through the eyes and hear it through the ears of the ancient world. That's a very powerful blessing. That's a very strong statement. It's beautiful praise for Ruth, saying that this daughter-in-law who's from Moab has become a greater blessing to you than seven sons would have been, who could have provided for you and looked after you and kept them, all these different things. This daughter is better. It's amazing. It's so encouraging. Even more astounding considering all she's been through and where she came from. What a wonderful change. What wonderful changes came into Ruth's life because she trusted Boaz and let him work on her behalf. She went to him and made the request. Remember at the end of chapter 3, she had to wait. She had to wait for him to go to work and to accomplish this on her behalf. She went from loneliness to love. She went from toil to rest, from poverty to wealth, from worry to assurance, and from despair to hope. This story reveals yet another beautiful comparison to our Savior. The value of the person redeemed is not established based on their works. It's established by the one who redeems them. Our value and worth is decided by the one who loves us and takes us in. How loved are you? Where is your identity? Where's your identity, church? It's in Christ. How loved are you? A lot. (laughs) More than we can describe. English fails us. English fails us to express. You are so loved by God because of who redeemed you. Who you were purchased by. Who you were saved by. We aren't identified We aren't decided for by where we were. If you want to know how much you love, look at the one who redeemed you. That's how loved you are. The redeemer is the one who transforms the status of the redeemed. And that's why we say we are in Christ Jesus. We find our identity in Christ Jesus. For more on that, the entire letter to the Ephesians. And in Christ, loved by him and saved by him, we no longer find our identity in ourselves, but rather it is established by the one who loves us and gave himself for us. My old identity, the land I came from, my flesh, my sin, my failure, all that sin, all that death, it was nailed to the cross. If you're in Christ Jesus, so is yours. Paul says this in Galatians 2.20, and we can say it and declare it alongside him. We have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer us who lives, but Christ lives in us. And Paul says, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let Moab go. We have a new citizenship. We've got a new family. We've got a new promise. And it's established by the one who's redeemed us. 
You see that begin here with the story of Obed. And he did exactly for his grandmother Naomi as the women spoke of him. He renews her life. He sustains her in her old age. Naomi takes this child and she places him in her lap and becomes a mother to him. New life brings new life to Naomi. This baby, she's reborn. She becomes a mother all over again. Mara, right? Naomi says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. I'm bitter. And what does God say? What does God have to say about it? He says, no, you're not. In fact, you're about to be a mom all over again. Get ready for a second life. That's the redemption of God. That's the beauty of what God does in our lives, church. We cannot forget that there is hope. Even if this life is hard and toilsome and difficult all the way to the end, we have eternity that follows. We have an eternity in Christ Jesus. We get to be with God for the rest of ever. And just sit down like when you were a kid and you used to try to think about how long eternity was. Did it ever make your head swim? As a kid, you'd be like, forever and ever and ever and ever. And you'd say it over and over to yourself. Do it again. Lay out in your lawn or some grassy knoll. Maybe a grassy knoll, a safe one. Lay out on some grassy area and look up at, that was a weird JFK reference. Lay way out there on this grassy knoll and look up, if you know, you know. Look up at the stars And I want you to just think about how big the universe is and how big our God is. Stare up at the stars and be in absolute amazement of the God who loves you and purchased you and redeemed you from sin and death. Be a kid again. That's what happens for Naomi. Be young again. Appreciate it. Be in awe and wonder. Let's not get old and jaded. Remember the wonder and the beauty of knowing that God is so big and we are so small and yet he loves us. Get back to the basics again. Stand in awe and wonder. Ruth 4 closes with a genealogy. And this is interesting. You know, and you're like, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be Mike teaching here if he didn't find something interesting in a genealogy. Well, here to serve I am, right there in verse 18. Check this out. Now, these are the family records of Perez. It goes all the way back to Perez, the son of Tamar. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Aminadab, Aminadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. Now, this may not seem like it's hugely significant because I've already let it drop several times that Ruth was the great-grandmother of David, but check this out. Deuteronomy 23.3 states this. No Ammonite or Moabite may enter the Lord's assembly. None of their descendants, even to the 10th generation, may ever enter the Lord's assembly. Huh. And the closing genealogy of this book is a 10-generation genealogy with a Moabite right in the middle of it who's part of the Davidic line and part of the Messianic line conundrum? No. Because she was a Moabite by birth. But she became a daughter and a wife and a mother and a great-grandmother by grace. Where we were not allowed to draw near, now we are. Where we were outcasts and not allowed in the assembly of God, now we are. We have been brought in. This is our story. Uh Uh-oh. And like, oh, sorry, my screen up here just went crazy. Sorry. Don't look back. This one's fine. <laughs> You're like, what's the matter? I was like, something's happening on this up here. You guys, are, are you grasping that? We may have been born into sin and death. We may have been outcast before. But now we are sons and daughters, we are husbands and wives, we are mothers and fathers, we are brothers and sisters, we are grandparents and great-grandparents, all by the grace of God through Jesus. We've been made a part of a family. Maybe you don't have a good connection with your family. You have a family here. You have the family of Christ. We've all been grafted in. The book of Ruth opens with three funerals. It closes with a wedding and the birth of a son. Not all of life's stories have this kind of happy ending, but this little book reminds us that for the Christian, God still writes the last chapter. We don't have to be afraid of the future. 
God has already written our final chapter. And we can rest in that. And we can wait for the Lord. Because, because he has gone before us. And he who began a good work in you will complete it at the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. So many beautiful pictures painted for us in the book of Ruth. I want to study it all over again. I wish that we could go back and go, next week, Ruth 1. Here we go again. And you know what? We would find all new things as we went through. I want to encourage you guys, be a student. Go back. Read through it again. Study it again. Enjoy the word of God. As we transition this morning to a time of communion, I just want us to take an opportunity to sing together, to worship as they distribute the elements for communion. I want you to be thinking about redemption. Our redemption because of the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. As we take communion, think about what it cost for us to be saved from our sin. And let's celebrate together that Jesus took action on our behalf and he took the risk and he laid down his life. He became one of us and laid down his life to purchase us from sin and death. Every single one of us who is in Christ, we share this together in unity as his church is an absolute necessity. We must have him. Apart from him, we can't do anything. And without him, we never would have been saved. So let's appreciate Christ together this morning. Worship team, come on up. I'm going to pray. And then we'll uh, receive the elements for communion. Hold on to them. We'll take them together after we sung for a bit. Lord, as we just take uh, the time right now to align, to calibrate ourselves, Lord, by the power of the Spirit with your thoughts and your heart. Lord, there's so many things that, that we can see in the book of Ruth. There's so many beautiful pictures of you. God, the story of redemption wouldn't exist without you. And Lord, thank you for one last time, for at least a little while, that we as a church had the opportunity to sit with you to read this incredible text. And Lord, I pray that it would echo throughout our lives for some time. Lord, that we wouldn't be able to get our minds off of the beautiful truth of redemption. Lord, that Boaz and Ruth and even Naomi shows us an amazing picture of. Lord, Naomi was transferred from bitterness back to life again, to joy. Lord, Ruth, who was born into a nation that was considered hostile to your people, was made part of your family. Boaz represented this faithful man who humbly and graciously just sought to bless others. And Lord, we just thank you that we get to continue. Lord, we get to continue on this journey with you and, and Lord, that you have saved us from our sin. We just remember you this morning as we, as we take time to sing your praise and worship. I just ask God that you would... Um, Lord, just align our hearts with yours so that we can understand maybe a greater depth of how much you love us, that you are our redeemer, and that we would worship you for who you are. We thank you, Jesus, for this time.